Hi. Um, sorry to be breaking into conversations. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sunny, and I just want to say a very, very warm welcome to Big Questions. If you've never been here before, um, thanks for coming along. I really do make yourselves at home, and I hope that you find this um, lunchtime enjoyable. I hope you find it interesting and useful for your own thinking. Um, this just does exactly what it says on the tin. We want to ask big questions about life, about meaning, and about Christianity. Um, the question we're going to be asking today, aren't Jesus and the God of the Old Testament contradictory? Um, to start us off, I'll be inviting Pete Williams up in a second um, to give us a short talk, and then there'll be time for some questions after that. Um, Dr. Pete Williams um, is an affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge as well as having lectured on the Old and New Testament um, here and at the University of Aberdeen. Um, his current research involves early translations of the Bible. So um, do be texting in any questions that you have. The number should be on your feedback forms on the tables, if you could grab one of those. And there's also some posters dotted around the building um, with the number on, so do be texting in. Um, I think that's enough from me. Um, without further ado, Dr. Pete Williams. No, 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 no need for that. Well, well done for taking this little break from your um, exam revision schedule, or some people say schedule. Um, what we're going to be looking at is the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. Uh, is that really the same? So hopefully we're going to have some slides coming up. Have we got slides coming up? We have, thank you. Well, while they don't, I'm just going to talk about what, what I'm going to say. I'm going to begin with a quotation from uh, Richard Dawkins, who uh, has got an interesting thing he says here, where he says, Jesus, in, you find in the New Testament in the Bible, uh, is a huge improvement over the cruel ogre of the Old Testament. The Sermon on the Mount, which is one of Jesus' teachings, is a way ahead of its time. His turn the other cheek anticipated Gandhi and Martin Luther King by 2,000 years. It was not for nothing that I wrote an article called Atheists for Jesus, which is a good article to read. Um, and he also says this. What was interesting and remarkable about Jesus was not the obvious fact that he believed in the God of his Jewish religion, but that he rebelled against many aspects of Yahweh. That's the name for uh, the Jewish God, at least according to many people. That's the correct pronunciation of the name that you're not supposed to pronounce. Um, uh, he rebelled against many aspects of Yahweh's vengeful nastiness. At least in the teachings that are attributed to him, he publicly advocated niceness and was one of the first to do so. To those steeped in the Sharia-like cruelties of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, parts of the Old Testament, um, to those brought up on the fear, uh, to fear the vindictive Ayatollah-like God of Abraham and Isaac, a charismatic young preacher who advocated generous forgiveness must have seemed radical to the point of subversion. No wonder they nailed him. So there he is. Uh, how you can be an atheist and still think Jesus is a nice guy. There was something uh, in, uh, I don't, this Cambridge student, does anyone read that? Uh, on a similar vein, this week. Well, just to, this isn't coming out very well colour-wise, but what you can see here is this is the New Testament by size, and that's the Old Testament. So Old and New Testament take about 70, 75 hours to read. Harry Potter will be at about 135 hours. So just to give you a sense, it's not um, necessarily that long. It's something you can manage pretty easily, and sometimes people try and read the New Testament in a whole day. That has been done. There was a re regular tradition of doing that in Robertson College, which has probably dropped out, but people used to get up really early in the morning and do that after their exams. Um, what, what, would, what happens in uh, the Old Testament in brief, well, this is just the political story of the Old Testament, is that God chooses one nation, Israel. He gives them loads of privileges. He gives them laws. And then he drives out some nations before them to give them a land. Uh, now, that would seem pretty unfair. Uh, then he also, when they do lots of wrong things, he drives them out as well. So that's a sort of very brief overview. I've missed out loads of really important things about the Old Testament, but that will do for our purposes. Then we'll go to what happens in the New Testament and Jesus in the Gospels. Well, actually, it's not radically different from what you have in the Old Testament because there's lots of continuity with the Old Testament. Lots of time you have quotations from the Old Testament and categories from the Old Testament. Jesus says that the Old Testament is really great. And he also is presented as fulfilling so much of the Old Testament. And that's rather different from what you find in, in the four Gospels, which are the earliest Gospels. That's rather different from what you find from later versions of the story of Jesus, such as you find in apocryphal Gospels, which are much, have much more Greek categories and much more um, 
divergent from the way Christianity began, which is within the cradle of Judaism. The earliest Christian sources are always the most Jewish ones, and the later ones uh, less so. So how do we react to the Old Testament? Well, we react in all sorts of negative ways, and part of it is because we react to other cultures because we think they're strange. I mean, many of us... Um, anyone French here? Okay. Now, many of us find the toilets in France um, substandard. On the other hand, the French come over and look at our cuisine, I wonder where that word came from, and they find that substandard. So actually we find other cultures strange. I've just been over to the US and there are parts of that that I find rather strange, but they find parts of our culture rather strange. And so we naturally tend to judge other cultures. When you get into them, you've spent longer time there, actually you realize there's an internal logic. So when we read ancient texts and they bash up against our culture, we're going to find them strange. We've also got a narrative which says that we're gradually on a path of progress. Uh, at least uh, some of us uh, are influenced by that to a greater and lesser degree, which means that we tend to look back at these people and think they're more primitive, they've got less logic to what they do, and aren't we on a path of moral progress? So I want to look at a couple of texts where people might have problems in the Old Testament and look at their logic. This one is from Deuteronomy, which, of course, Richard Dawkins alluded to, uh, and it's a, a bit of law. It says, One witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offence he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse a man of a crime, the two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges must make thorough investigation, and if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now what you can see there is it's a, a, a grim form of justice. It's a very hard form of justice, but it is an equal form of justice. And although we might not want to enact this today, there might be all sorts of reasons for not enacting this today, the principles underlying it of doing to someone exactly what they were going to do to someone are in fact based on a real uh, basis of equality. Now, at the moment, there are about 290 DNA cases in the US which are being reviewed because expert evidence is thought to have been uh, overplayed in order to convict people. And the, the thing about that expert evidence is if the expert gives wrong evidence, and one of they, some of you may be some of those experts, there is no forfeit involved in the whole system. The system here was a system, of course, pre-DNA. Well, well, the DNA was around, but they didn't know about it. Uh, but it was a system in which the witness actually had... A, 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 their, their, their own situation was at stake. You don't have casual litigation in this situation uh, where... They, and they don't have prison in the Old Testament at all as a part of the system. They have no um, privilege of rich and poor. They have no uh, criminal records or anything like that. And no ground for complaint that someone got worse than they deserve because they got back exactly what um, they'd done. Now, you, you might find all this rather abhorrent, but some of you will have watched, uh, was it Maze Runner, uh, where actually you find that in certain extreme situations, they might be imaginary scenarios, very quickly people need to put in fairly extreme forms of punishment in order to um, ha have the commu um, protect the community. We think prisons are a great idea. They, 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 there are some problems with um, prisons. But one thing about prisons is really they only can exist when you've got an economic surplus. If you don't have an economic surplus, uh, in which case you can actually incarcerate people and you know, uh, feed them and look after them, it's not actually possible. So in other words, we can judge a culture and we can say, oh, that's really yucky, you wouldn't want to do that. But I would just invite you to think more deeply about the logic that's involved and realize that there are some uh, good principles of justice here. Uh, we're in a different situation, not suggesting that one should apply these things directly, but you go to the logic which is behind it and you'll find that the idea of um, getting rid of casual litigation, well, that would be something that would be really nice in our own culture. Also, physical punishment only comes for physical crime. So the idea that someone might steal and get their hand cut off is simply not there. So uh, Dawkins' comparison uh, with uh, other legal systems is not really fair. Financial penalties are what you get for financial crimes. So that's one thing, just about Old Testament law, and we can go to any of the laws and explore them if you want to. 
Secondly, people are troubled by the fact that the Old Testament has violence within the narrative. It has war within the narrative, and some of that war is approved of. Now, of course, some of it could be simply violence that's reported in a narrative, and it's not telling you that it thinks this violence is good. On the other hand, there are some wars which are approved of, and we could go and explore that in question time if you like, but I'd really like a whole talk if I have to do that. Um, but it does occur in the context of some very strange national literature. Um, if you go to Egypt and you look at the walls and of the temples, what are they telling you? Well, they're telling you that Ramses is great, or Amenhotep is great, or that Ra, the god, is great. They're telling you this sort of thing. When you look at the national literature that's come from Israel, it is the least nationalistic of all national literature I can think of. I don't know any people group which says as much negative about itself as the uh, national literature of Israel says about the people of Israel. So this is an interesting thing, and I think it deserves our listening to because of that. Many of the objections to um, the Is Israelite national literature actually border on anti-Semitism at times uh, when they don't really take into account the situation uh, that was going on. So when people try and say, well, this is like wars which have God's, people claim God's backing for today, I would say that there are numerous differences. I once listed 20 of them, which actually would divide these things. So in, 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 t in terms of the whole uh, system that's going on, someone getting in their head the idea that they can kill someone in God's name is very different from what you have in the Old Testament. You have big delays whenever there's punishment. You have rules uh, against rape. The only ancient culture to outlaw rape on the battlefield is uh, found in the Old Testament, treating the bodies of the defeated with respect. And also, it's in the context of a very miraculous story. Now, you might be an atheist, but one thing what happens is when, when you read, let's say, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or whatever it is, you, for the sake of the story, believe in elves. For the sake of the story, you believe in the magical world. Uh, and I'd want to say, even if you're an atheist and you read the Old Testament, let's remember that the story is a miraculous story. God is actually the major, uh, most significant character in the story of the Old Testament. Therefore, I'm, if I'm going to judge it morally as a story, I need to factor him in as a real character. And therefore, I need to judge all of the characters within the context of the miraculous story. I can't sort of strip out the miracles and then judge the remaining narrative, which is what I think a lot of people like to do. It's a bit like trying to judge Odysseus in the Odyssey as if Athena isn't a real character. You simply can't do it. So how does Jesus then fit in with the Old Testament? Well, I'd want to say it's dealing with the same problem, the same problem, which is the problem of human wrongdoing. That is a theme through the Old Testament, and Jesus is actually answering that because the message of the New Testament is that he died taking the punishment which uh, our wrongdoing deserves. The Old Testament is also a, sets up a series of failures. Um, so g going through the story of the Old Testament, there are various ways that God shows that dealing with the human problem of sin doesn't work. You can privilege a nation, you can give them laws, you can give them kings, you can give them prophets who call them back to the laws, you can uh, judge them and so on. It doesn't actually get rid of the wrong which is in human lives. And so there is an answer to a question posed by the Old Testament because the Old Testament doesn't actually solve that problem, which is answered in the New Testament. And the Old Testament, as it goes through, and all the various human solutions don't seem to work, you get to the answer that only God is going to be able to help. And therefore, when Jesus comes along, and Jesus is believed uh, to be, by Christians to be God, and is presented uh, in very godlike ways in the New Testament, then that seems to fit rather well. In fact, we can say that when you think about the time he died, we've just had Easter. Easter is, of course, uh, in French, it's Pâques, isn't it? Well, sorry about my pronunciation, but it's, it's uh, the, the word Passover. That's what it is. Easter is Passover. In other words, it is the biggest Jewish festival, the time when the Jews celebrated their biggest deliverance when they'd been brought out of Egypt. That's precisely the time when Jesus died. Now, of all the times, coincidentally, to die in order to scoop up lots of Old Testament rescue symbolism, it was very convenient that he died. There are a number of coincidences with Jesus' life, and that's just one of them. Um, <clears throat> and you could actually say that the Old Testament sacrificial system could be seen as symbolic of him. Now, you might think that's a bit of a... a, a, a um, a stretch, but when you start seeing lots and lots of symbols converge on this being, then it becomes more plausible. It's an argument, quantitatively, that it becomes more plausible as an argument that he is actually the fulfillment of what's come before. Now, you could see the Old Testament also as setting up 
categories that help you think about things. When uh, Jesus came along, he talked about the kingdom of God. Now, you might think, what on earth is that? And the argument is it's a transformation that takes our, uh, place within individuals. But until you've actually understood what a kingdom is in the first place, to ab- understand the kingdom, uh, in, 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 if you don't have the concrete, it's hard to understand the abstract. So, in fact, the categories are set up. And he comes in a very early stage to be believed to be the God of the Old Testament himself. You look at someone like the uh, Roman writer Pliny writing to the Emperor Trajan around the year 112, basically talking of Jesus as being worshipped in Christian meetings as God. When you look at the New Testament, he's presented as the person who made the world, judges the world, and has God's presence with him. And since for Judaism there's a really strong categorization that there is only one God, and only God made the world, and only God judges the world, for Jesus to be presented as the one that you worship when you're in a culture where you only worship God makes you realise that he is being presented as God himself. So I'd want to argue that what Jesus is doing in relation to the Old Testament is actually fulfilling. It's not going off in a completely different direction. Yes, there is a surprise when it comes to the New Testament. Lots of surprise. It's actually talked about. But when you look back with hindsight, you can realise that a lot of it was being planned for. Well, there we are. That's what I had to share with you. There is a number behind me to which you can...